And I'd like to say a warm welcome to the northern Ardennes of Belgium, but in fact it is extremely cold, barely above freezing. I would think with the chill factor it is at freezing point. There is even snow threatened in the Ardennes today for this, the 63rd running of the Flesh Wallon at the Wallonay Arrow Race. And this itself, although not a counter in the World Cup, has managed to keep its identity and, if anything, improve in popularity. It's based right here where we're approaching now on the wall of Hui. The town of Hui in the Ardennes hosting this race for some years now. They climb this mountain and that's really what it is. It's a 20% incline, uh, something like three times. They finish at the top of it and we are now approaching it for the second time. 13 riders have got themselves clear and in this breakaway we've got Patrick Yonker of Rabobank and other riders of note up here too uh, include um, the Cofferdis rider Bobby Julik. Now they're only about 50 seconds ahead of the main field which is getting smaller smaller by the minute as riders decide to climb off it really is most unpleasant conditions uh, we expect to see riders in March and perhaps February dressed like this uh, but not in April although those of us that know Belgium in April well anything really can happen this is a most beautiful area and what a contrast to last week's well only a four days ago in fact the Paris Roubaix last Sunday when the weather was sunny and fine and that great victory by Andrea Taffy well Taffy uh, taking a rest now as too is Frank Vandenbroek and so we're likely to see a new winner today and uh, no, uh, no Jan Ulrich starting today either which is interesting because his build up for the Tour de France uh, still not really on course is it there's Bobby Julik off to the right of our picture here and just tucking into the left we've got uh, Patrick Jonker never sure whether to call him an Australian or a Dutchman at the moment he's got a Dutch racing license but he rumours uh, that he'll become an Australian next year because he wants to ride the Olympic Games in Sydney uh, for Australia which is indeed where he lives now first chance to see the climb here now as the riders make their way steadily up it a little bit of an acceleration coming now and uh, this looks like Patrice Halgon of the Festina team who's trying to get clear of the field as he builds up a little lead trying to get something going I think because as you can see the main field is now on the climb itself not very far down I doubt whether it's much more than 30 seconds now and the field is still quite large considering that the weather is so cold and absolutely miserable today 188 on the start line this morning and uh, the race distance 200 kilometers once over the top of this climb they'll know they're inside 100 kilometers on the finish something like uh, 92 kilometers left to go this is Jens Voigt part of that leading group also trying to get a little bit of action going uh, Halgon who really uh, wants to do something to put Festina back on the map I think because after the disgrace of the Tour de France we've seen nothing of this team at all they completely well almost completely revamp their team uh, after the Tour de France debacle last year and now we'll have to wait and see if they can indeed become once again a team to be reckoned with or was it really all done on the benefit of doping we'll find out as time unfolds I'm sure so the field continuing then to try and get something going here as the breakaways continue to build up uh, you caught a glimpse there of um, Jürgen Gunz the Belgian rider of Flandre in 2002 in the yellow jersey he's up in this breakaway Jens Voigt having a great season, winner by a centimetre of the Criterium International, ahead of the British rider David Miller from Copidis, who's a surprise starter in this race today. Even he didn't realise he was coming to it, but he's here somewhere. We haven't seen anything of him. Julik anxious to get something going as well. 
they continue now to whip up the pace. Sadly, the race without last year's uh, very emphatic winner, uh, Bo Hamburger, the Dane, uh, simply because he's had a really torrid start to the new year. He's had a back problem. He's been in hospital, had his back operated on, and he's still uh, not anywhere like race fit. Let's hope he can get himself back into the action in time for the Tour de France. He's still got a few weeks to do that. If he can get in some of the uh, late tours that build up for the Tour de France, like the Dauphiné, the Midi Libre, and the Tour de Switzerland. Now, back to the main field here now. Looks like a little bit of trouble viewing here. It looks as though Michele Bartoli spoke to his teammate there and wanted a little bit more action from him. The rider who Bartoli shouted at was his old faithful, Paolo Bettini. And Bettini has powered, up, powered forward there and decided that he wants to do something about this leading breakaway. Interesting to see that Bartley taking an interest at this stage. Marco Velo is the uh, Mercatoni Uno rider up here in this leading group, just going through that yellow jersey. Now this uh, seems to be the signal here for a group to start working at the front of the peloton. They've smelt the fact that they are very close to picking up the leaders. And a lot of riders willing now to uh, try and get things moving. Tilly Bourguignon saw him just go through for the big mat team. Swiss champion passed through our, our picture there. Uh, Michael Bogart tipped by many for a win today. But Bogart himself saying if he's going to win it, he's got to be ahead of the stars before they come to the last climb of the Hui, which is now about 89 kilometers away. Uh, because he, they say they don't th he doesn't think he'll have the power uh, to drag people like Bartley towards the summit and still hold them off in the sprint. But it looks to me as though they started to pick up the remnants of that breakaway or the breakaway itself is getting a little bit larger because they've reached them very very quickly over the top of the climb. You can see the weather on our cameras now. It is. Uh, it started to ease off at the bottom by the Meurs, but it's now started to get uh, much much colder again. Andrei Kivalev, the Kazakh rider for Festina term pro at the start of last season had a great first year and number five going through Massimiliano Gentili for the Cantina team yellow for danger remember in Europe as the riders make this left flick away now on this big circuit which isn't flat by any means and the conditions of the road surface although basically very good roads here in the northern Ardennes now this is a most attractive part of Belgium, believe it or not, because when the sun comes out, there really is nowhere else you'd wish to be. And it looks to me either we're looking here now at the head of the peloton, or there's been a steady increase of riders in this front group. Rabobank deciding now it's time to try and pull Michael Bulgert into the thick of the action here now. They've had their man in that breakaway, and we're going up to it here with the camera from the helicopter, so they've reduced that from 40 seconds. There's one rider there. Looks like a Francaise de Jure rider, so it could be Vogenby. And in fact, it's this rider here who's just accelerated away from the field. And it's the Benesto rider. And so that's interesting because Benesto are not having a good year at all. This is Cesar Solon, the Spaniard on the best Benesto team, who's now trying to launch an attack. Not exactly a big man when it comes to looking at victories over the years gone by, but he looks as though he's trying to start something now for Benesto because they've come here really not with a great team at all, but they at least are taking part in the races in the area of Belgium and France at this time of the year. The Spanish teams really don't like the Spring Classics in this region. The weather doesn't suit them. The road surfaces don't suit them. They're a little bit more... Uh, affinity shown towards this type of race, the flesh wool on, and of course the upcoming Liège Bastogne Liège, which is just uh, in the weekend ahead. This used to be and still is, in effect, the Ardenne weekend, but they used to be run Saturday and Sunday. Now they run Wednesday and Sunday, but there's still uh, the, the rider with the uh, best overall positions on aggregate uh, receives a special award as winner of the Ardenne weekend. They got. 87 kilometers to go now to the finish and it looks as though we're trying to shape a decisive move here it's around this point usually a little bit later actually around about 45 50 kilometers to go when the final moves are made but it looks as though uh, Salon is trying now to shape this race from the front as he disappeared into the narrow roads Benesto, since they lost uh, Miguel Indurain haven't really been the team to reckon with they're relying very heavily this year on Jimenez uh, to do well in the Giro d'Italia and possibly in the Tour de France. But as the sport now occupies a lot of its time trying to combat uh, drug taking, there is clearly a lot of swinging in riders' form, for whatever reason you may wish to say for yourselves. 
Now it looks as though that lead group is up to around about 15 to 20 riders got clear. And here's a little bit of the route for you. We've done the big leg from Charleroi where the race started. We've done the little blue leg. We're now out on the red leg which takes us around these small hills up towards the finish which will bring us back up the Hui and the finish. By the way, the Belgians, not so surprisingly, should do well in their own race. They've won this race 35 times, but they haven't won it, in fact, for 10 years. And that was with the line of Flanders, as they used to call him, uh, Claude Cricillon. Crick the line was his nickname, and uh, they haven't had a victory since 1989. And ironically, he was also the previous uh, Belgian before that, in 1985. And if you're looking for a different name, then you go back to 1981. Uh, Willems, Daniel Willems, who got the victory then. That was over 240 kilometres. But the race has come down in length, really, over these past few years, because it's bridging between the two big World Cup classics, I suspect. Instead of 250 and 240 kilometres, it's now just 200. And it's an excellent race as a bridge for the riders midweek. And, of course, uh, I think it still stands out on its own. But when you get weather like this, there's a reminder it is spring there from the blossoms. <laughs> but you wouldn't believe it from being out there today. We started at uh, 3 degrees Celsius, which I think is barely 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I would say, as I said earlier, with the chill factor, I believe you'd be absolutely freezing down there today. Spoken from the heart, because I spent many a wet cycle race in Belgium. And this area at least will have some hills to break it up. The national champion's jersey, easy to pick out down there, of uh, Michael Bogart. The red top of the champion of Holland. He had a great start of the year with his victory in Paris-Nice. The Côte de France, but we are in Belgium by the way, just approximately 9% or uh, 1 in 11 talk in the old terms like I sometimes do as Festina trying to keep this race plenty of action on the front Patrice Algan still up there and there's no doubt now that uh, ever since we came over the Hui with one big circuit to go there's a number of riders now testing other riders this is uh, Bettini again or is it Bartoli this might be Bartoli is going they ride very similarly especially from a helicopter shot but it looks to me like it is Michele Bartoli now Bartoli told Bettini to move to the front and start to toughen it up a bit as he came over the top of the Hui. Now this might be the reason why, because here on the Côte de France, Bartoli has launched a lone attack and at the moment it looks to me as though he's trying to go clear. Somebody's coming up to him. Now it looks like a Rabobank rider has got across to him and one other rider. So we've got three, well, the other right looks like it's Kamazin, the world champion is tagged on. Let's go back down. This is the chase group. This isn't the league group we're looking at here. There's three riders trying to get together. Oh, no, it is. It is indeed Bartoli, and he's, in fact, been joined here by the Rabobank rider. And the Rabobank rider is, in fact, uh, Marcus Zeberg. And the, it's a Credit Agricole rider who's come up. And this, uh, this is Cedric Vasseur former leader of the Tour de France, his dad Alain, stage winner of the Tour de France, but Vasseur now onto the back with uh, Marcus Seberg, a rider who rides so well in these classics. Come across this year from the uh, Swiss Post team where he sort of has been discovered if you like with his results in the Tour of Spain last year, a couple of stage wins, top and tail of the Tour of uh, Spain and now uh, been taken up by Jan Ross. Interesting move, coming uh, with an awful long way to race here. Bartley perhaps inviting others to come across the gap to join. Well, they might be on the way because they're still working pretty hard here. Bogart in second wheel, and he's got a little bit of a group coming across now. Kamazin is in this group now. The world champion is white jersey standing out. It looked as though uh, the colours of Credit Agricole was a white jersey from that helicopter shot we got a little bit earlier, but he's still here. It's nice to see a uh, world champion taking part at the sharp end of the action, having uh, remembered that uh, Kamazin won his first big race of the season last year, and it was the world title. Uh, but he certainly consolidated after that with a victory in the Tour of Lombardy. So two wins isn't bad when you get those sort of races on your honours list for the season. Now Bartley here appears to have gone again. He's waited till some riders have joined him, and he's launched yet another attack. 
And I have to say, the weather is going downhill, even if Michele Bartoli isn't, because this rain is getting a little bit heavier here. So we've gone over the climb of the Côte de France. And can you believe this morning they forecast snow in the region? And you can see now it's almost sleet as it uh, rips across our camera lens down by the helicopter there. 79 kilometers to go. And that big field now is spread right across the northern Ardennes here. This seems to be the forward group of strong men or brave men. About 30 strong, maybe. And you know there are flecks of snow in that uh, rain now as the weather continues to crack wide open. But there's a group trying to get away here and rip up to this looks like little Massalia who's trying now to bridge the gap as well. And Martin Dembaka, I think it is, on his wheel. So Bartoli has gone and these two are trying to reach him. Now these roads are twisty. They're obviously very dangerous right now because they're pretty wet. The tyres will be not too hard, I wouldn't imagine, because the riders have plenty of warning of this bad weather today before they rolled away from Charlois. Scene of the Tour de France about 15 years ago where we had the start. Four riders trying to get themselves all together there now. And building steadily. The Lamprey rider, Massalier, dropping back and he's let the I think it's then back go forward and he's come back to that chase group. So it is Martin Dembaka who says he's on his best form ever. He had a brilliant uh, Paris Roubaix, but a lot of bad luck. He was brought down, in fact, by Frank Vandenbroek. Just look at this rain, and there's Kamazin going across now. So he's shot out of that group as Massalia went back to him, and I think it was Massalia. Kamazin has decided now to try and get across to Martin Dembaka, former Dutch champion, and see if they can pull back Bartoli. Well, there's Bartoli just there, so we're going to have three riders in the lead, and uh, the gauntlet down again to anybody that wants to join them. They are attacking, remember, in what is the worst conditions of the day so far, and they're facing at the moment around about 78 kilometers to the finish, so the best part of two hours. It's a long time to stay out front, just three of you, but anyway, they've thrown the gauntlet down. Oscar Kamazin, the world champion whose season started this year, in the uh, tour down under in Australia when he wasn't a real player but he certainly got himself some nice form because the weather was superb and the, what a contrast now and he must be wishing he was back in South Australia and Adelaide in particular where at times the weather topped 100 degrees or over 40 degrees Celsius and now we're barely 40 degrees Fahrenheit what a change anyway he's got plenty of speed in those legs now as he's trying uh, along with Michele Bartoli and um, Martin Dembaka to establish a little gap over the field here to allow only the strong riders to cross it. There's the man who says his form has never been better, who enjoyed immensely Paris Roubaix, and there aren't many people can say that, but at the end of the day, bad luck took him out of the chance of a real uh, top position. Well, I think we can confirm snow is falling in the Ardennes now, because that certainly looks like it to me. No wins for Kamazin yet this year. He sits there and he's won a total of 14 races in his career, which started only in 1996 as a pro. Lamprey have picked him up. A very good climber. Should enjoy the Giro. And he shouldn't get too much of this weather, but you know you can in the Tour of Italy when you get up onto the high mountains of the Dolomites. The the pictures are rife of Andy Hampson racing through snowstorms in the Giro d'Italia. I'm very, very surprised to see that three big names uh, have gone and nobody has come across, and it must be because of the weather. They're all going to. There was a whole cell. There's two riders now trying to bridge the gap. There's a whole series of attacks there, and it makes you wonder uh, whether these riders are just huddling together now strictly for the warmth of the day, because you're going to have to feel a little bit sorry for them, I think. I shouldn't be too surprised with weather like this. It'll be a bit of a shock to the two Italians, I would think, although Martin Dembaka might be used to it. Martelli is saying something there. Oh, goodness knows in what language. He certainly won't speak Dutch, as he wants uh, Dembaka to come through and do a little bit more work. And 
Bartoli gets the bit between his teeth, he just lays down on that bicycle and really goes quickly. Kamazin doesn't seem to be enjoying, in fact, uh, Kamazin doesn't seem to be enjoying it at all. You may have caught a glimpse of his face there, the spray coming up. These are the chases. Well, Patrice Holgon has done very well to be still in on this one because he was in the original breakaway and he's still out in front trying to get across the gap here. Now, I'm not sure whether he can or not, but we'll see. And he's getting plenty of help at the moment from the Flandern 2002 rider, Jurgen Guntz, the Belgian. And with every respect to these two riders, they've hardly got the, fire, the known firepower, should I say, in their legs uh, to get up to those three riders out in front. Nicky Eversol, the Swiss champion. Good job that cross isn't red or they'll all get worried as they start uh, now to straighten out his glasses and a little bit of sitting up at the back. We look down now on the white jersey of Oscar Kamazin. Two wins last year. He was the first rider, by the way, since Koble from Switzerland to win the World Championship. And Koble won the last title for the World Professional Championship for Switzerland uh, in 1951. So you can imagine the welcome home he got. And it wasn't a, a lucky win at all. It was a very, very good win indeed. The year before that, he was the Swiss national champion. So he only seems to pick the big wins. He doesn't seem to bother with the little races. He just uses them for training. Here is Guns. Making steady progress, but they're not uh, actually gaining on those leaders at the moment. The nursery team, 2002, turned out one or two good riders of late and passed them on to the bigger teams. There are three distinct divisions now in professional cycling, third division, second and the elite first division teams. And ideally, as the riders get better and better in the lower teams, they're snapped up and given more money to ride in the elite teams. Now we're going to get a lot of this picture break up I fear today because the weather is deteriorating and by its very nature we race a lot in wooded countryside in the flesh wall on and that will uh, not help put the signals going up towards the helicopter from the motos today. Now big effort there by Michele Bartoli and the same coming through from the other two. These three riders are looking very strong now. Perhaps indeed it was a recovery process for Kamazin. He seems to be okay now. A minute 24 already. This is an enormous gap. Already going back now to Holgon and uh, Daniel. Well, there's no way those two are going to get up here. They're actually losing ground at the minute. And we're out on the big circuit with a couple of short, sharp climbs to come as well before the Hui. Now, this is not the sort of system that Rabobank wanted, really. They were hoping they would have had Bogard up here. But Dembaka, they accept, has the great form. 70 kilometers still to race. It's a long way to go. But we're looking at three riders who know all about long time breakaways when it comes down to it. Martin Dembaka, an old hand. This is his ninth pro season and he's now 30 years of age. So he turned pro at the ripe old age of 21 and he's uh, only won 18 races but he has been such a threat. I mean the biggest disaster of his life is when his sister died. Uh, and which caused him to withdraw from the Tour de France on the most sad occasion a couple of years ago. But he seems to have come back and continued to race uh, with uh, great determination. 67 kilometres from the finish now. He was the national champion of Holland before Michael Bulgart took over the mantle. And one of his best results, I suspect he will tell you, was back in 1994 when he finished second in the Tour de l'Avenir, which is the... Uh, or was on those occasions the, the smaller Tour de France, the race of the future, which is what it actually means. And there seems to be a problem here because Kamazin has dropped off the, the tail of those three for some reason. Back to the chase group. On say the big losers at the moment. I'm trying now to put things to right because Jalabert uh, is in here somewhere. One or two riders now trying to organise a chase because it's not. Uh, it doesn't look as though there's great evidence of teammates trying to slow down the counter move here. The Cote de Ref, 12% climb. 
Nothing's ever greatly distanced. This is only 2.2 kilometers. The, the, uh, the wall itself at the finish is barely a mile. It's approximately just over three quarters, actually. As Kamazin's okay, he's back with the group here and setting on the pace on the Cote de Ref. This little compact little man, Bartoli. Well, the Cote de Ref is about 60 kilometers from the finish when they get over the top of it. Bartley with his long finger gloves on. Surprising, he hasn't got leg warmers on, but sometimes it's most unpleasant to have wet legs as well. Kamazin dropping back to have a word with his manager, who I'm sure is delighted to see that their world champion is starting to feature a little bit earlier than last year, when he wasn't, of course, the world champion. But he's now having to take on the mantle of being a star. And when you pull on the rainbow jersey, well, I guess you feel as though you should be in the action because, after all, you are the top dog. Bartley, world number one. Kamazin, because of his two victories last year, which were exceptional, is now uh, world number seven. Further down the Cote de Ref here, and the Anse boys trying to get something going. And this is to the bunch now, so we picked up the two riders in between. And, and because of the reaction by the Anse, they're now limiting the escape inside two minutes. Bartley getting a bit of food out of his back pocket and just making sure he's nothing's going to go wrong in what remains in about the last uh, 38, 37 miles to go to the finish. Well, it's gone up again now and it's going up as we look at the clock. Two minutes, eight seconds. Well, this is an extraordinary escape if this one does succeed. Nobody assisting Anse. One of uh, Bartley's teammates got himself in on the action there right now to try and interfere with the pace. I think, in fact, two of the Mafé boys have got themselves up there. And little flurries of snow still falling here in the Ardennes. There's a history of these mountains stretching back right through into France as they form part of the Massif Central, which takes you right down into the area of the Puy de Dom. This is the area, by the way, where we had the famous Battle of the Bulge during World War II. And there's still plenty of evidence of American tanks in some of the cities, like Bastogne, which uh, is um, happy memories in many ways for the Belgians. Sadness, of course, but basically uh, they don't forget those that were saved, that saved by the Americans. And this race itself, having started back in 1936, when de Meersman was the winner, it was the brainchild of a couple of journalists, as most of the international races were in, were in France and Belgium. Uh, started from a Brussels newspaper called Sports and uh, it stopped really since then only for the First World War because in fact uh, it never, apart from 1940 uh, as the war was gathering momentum, it was actually held in 1941, 2, 3 and 4. So during the war years it was in fact held, although it wasn't held uh, before 1936 because that was when it was founded. Just look at those fields covered in mud. And it looks now like uh, Laurent Jalabert here. He's not terribly happy with the way things are going. He's got his racing cape on. Just gathering in the miles, I think, sitting right down at the back end of the peloton, letting his teammates do the chasing. And if they get close to the leaders, then he might come to the front. Otherwise, I think he's just going to sit there by the look of it. He doesn't look at all concerned with the way the race is going. He looks unhappy champion of France. He's got his own problems this year. He has a Swiss racing license because he's fallen out with the French Federation and it wouldn't surprise me if they retal retal uh, retaliate by stopping him riding in any of the Federation's events this year which would of course be the World Championships um, at the French national title where he has to defend his title, would like to defend his title I'm sure. He could well find himself uh, not able to do so in June. Back to the leaders. Doesn't look like there's any passengers up here, does it? Heading up to the next small climb now. Oh, this is the downhill. Sorry, this is the downhill, 6%. Kamazin. Well, if it's downhill, Kamazin's out of the saddle here. And Bartoli and Dembaka. Two Italians versus a Dutchman on Belgian roads. And the Belgians beginning to lose their grip on the flesh full on over the years. Because it's had a whole variety of different winners. Uh, 
Bo Hamburger from Denmark last year. Laurent Jalabert won it in 97 and 95. And that, uh, the man who split those two victories was Lance Armstrong of the United States with a wonderful victory in 96. And then we had the Italians, Argentine, Pondriest, Ferlin, Argentine twice before that. The man of the flesh, he won it three times and has joined the record held by Marcel Kint, who did it in 43, 44 and 45. And Eddie Merckx, of course, who seems to be on every record book, he did it in 1967, 70 and 72. The hills continue as we go on to the Côte d'Ossogne, 50 kilometres from the finish here. And the snow as we get up just those few metres again coming down. A couple of brave spectators out there today. There actually is a huge crowd as you probably saw as they climbed up the Hui. Huge crowd waiting for the finish but you know even the Hui itself there's only one cafe on the top of that climb and it gets rather busy. Uh, and otherwise I'm afraid you're stuck out in the open air so you've got to be a pretty brave man if you follow uh, the flesh will on in weather conditions like this. The actual town of Hui, which is uh, on the River Meurs, a, a river which if you just stay on the banks of it, you'll go directly into Holland, it's only literally down the road, um, is a lovely little town, as many of these spa towns are in the area. Race for many years used to start at Spa and finish in Hui. Spa is where uh, they have a mountain bike World Cup race, or they have had in the past. Here comes Bartoli. Four wins this year for Michele at the moment. He won a stage of the Tour of Andalusia. He won a stage in the Tour of Valencia. And of course his big claim to fame this year was the overall classification, without winning a stage by the way, in uh, Terano Adriatico. And he also has just won Flesh at Brabanson. He loves racing in Belgium, which is strange for the Italians, but the other Italians always have done well in Belgium. Argentine was the other man who always rode well here. And Francesca Moser rode well, especially in the Paris-Roubaix. And uh, Fondriest, who actually rode for the Dutch team Panasonic, he used to ride well before he, he had his back problems in the Belgian area and in the French zones. Because most Italians really don't like coming out of Italy. But I think that trend is changing now. Mind you, having seen the weather today, they might want to go back. And I can't blame them for that. On the poultry riders there, I think it was David Rebelin, caught with his mouth full there. As he put all his food in and held onto the handlebars for that tricky right-hander on what are now extremely slippery conditions. This race, by the way, part of the Tour de France organisation now, the Société de Tour de France, are... Uh, organizers of this event as they are with the Liège Baston Liège and that's why the cars you're seeing down there look very familiar to that you those used in the Tour de France and that's because they are the same cars. But Bartoli is showing no fear at all of the descent. You do well to shy clear of those white lines because so often they can become slippery. But where has Camazin gone? because Kamazin is, is somewhere at the back and Bartoli is pushed on here as we go on to the Côte de Boisseau another one as steep this in fact as the Hui itself but not quite as long now I don't see uh, we've lost Kamazin he's dropped back somewhere and uh, that doesn't all well leaving just two rides but at the moment the gap is up and continues to be up. Here's Michael Bogart, still trying very hard to do something. He's in a little bit of a compromised position now because of his man up front. He knows that Dembaka is on form. He, he knows that probably he could win this race, although Bartley is the, is the big worry for everybody here. As these riders now looking a little bit grim-faced, aren't they, on the climb? is when it's uh, not such a glorious thing to be a professional bike rider but these races have to be completed and let's hope that uh, they don't find themselves in 10 days time getting a sore throat and all the usual things that follow for a few weeks what a bleak picture that is could be the world cyclocross championship right now but instead it's Michele Bartoli continues on 30 uh, 39 wins as a professional, Bartoli turned pro in the August of 1992 and he's now just uh, 29 years of age and he's only 24 kilometres from the finish, almost a kilometre for each year.
Now there's a counter-attack coming off the bottom here. This is the Lotto team. Mario Ertz. Long, tall Mario, who is developing into quite a good bike rider. Is Mario Ertz. And he's got Bogart with him. Now this is an interesting move here. Bogart could have a free lift up to the front if he could work out. Here's Kamazin, and he seems to be in no man's land. Now, Bogart may well be approaching Kamazin along with Ertz. From what I can understand from the cars here, Kamazin has dropped back because he could not undo the zip or something on his World Championship jersey and he wanted to open, uh, zip the neck up. He's changed his jersey, in fact, so maybe we'll see that if we can get a glimpse so before he gets too dirty. But I'll tell you what, if he dropped back just for something like that and not through fatigue, and he's been joined here by these two now, uh, then I would think that uh, Dembaka and Bartley will not be his favourite riders after today because that's not really uh, the sporting thing to do. The riders do not attack riders who are uh, just doing something like taking a drink or, or uh, a natural break or whatever, but um, or a puncture. They usually allow them to come back. But in fact, maybe uh, Kamazin can get back up there now because he's been joined by Mario Ertz and Martin Dembaka. atrocious conditions and 3 minutes 20 so Kamazin went back big time didn't he but it's not that far back in fact to the main field what's left of it about 30 riders coming up at 3.45 we've gone back to the two leaders here hope we'll get to see them through to the finish because our camera lens is getting a little bit covered in in snow or sleet uh, just now so the race continues to tumble down towards the finish We've got just a small climb of the Côte d'Anne to come, which is 11 kilometres from the finish. Then we drop down to the banks of the Meuse, cross over the Meuse, and then we're up onto the onto the Mour de Huy. Bartle here churning a big gear now. There's a little bit more gentle pedalling, a bit more souplesse coming from Martin Denbacher. Mario Ertz, who we've just seen on the counter-attack, he's a typical uh, man that's moving through the ranks on the nursery team of Flandre in 2002. That's where he started. He's only been a pro. This is his third season as a pro. He's trying to come up now with uh, with uh, Michael Bogart and cameras in. There's the Mers. And we're 14, nearly 15 kilometres from the finish. Looks rather pristine, neat and tidy, doesn't it? Which uh, carries all the barges which ply between Belgium, France, Germany and Holland. Surprisingly quiet today. I don't even think that one's moving. Probably the weather depressing just about everybody. On the smooth highways now. As the riders race down towards the finishing line. Still these two in the lead. Took a big gamble today, but Bartley must have felt something because when he signaled Bettini to start the pace, start sharpening up the pace, uh, then I think he was saying to himself, I'm going to have a go. And it looks to me as though he got something going there. And well done to Dembaka and Kamazin who spotted it and I think it's rather unfortunate that Kamazin is not still here but look at this now as Bartoli is just testing now Dembaka to see how he's going because the climb of the Pui could well decide it and I would say will decide it right now Dembaka not putting so much into it now maybe he's struggling just that little bit And we haven't suffered too much in picture breakup. We're getting a little bit of it now in the trees here. Bartley, winner of Liège Baston Liège last year, third in the Amstel Gold, and of course the uh, not only the world number one but also the World Cup holder. He had a, an absolutely magical 1998 season, and he looks good again. He's had the World Cup in fact for the last two years, and he's also won back-to-back Liège Baston Liège. He was fourth, by the way, in Flesh Will On in '97. So that's two years ago now. And to complete his record in this event, he was also fifth here last year. Now he's looking for the win, and I think there's only one man going to spoil it for him, possibly, and that's the Rabobank Dutchman alongside him. Because the field behind are slipping out of contention here. Preoccupied now in the minor placings. We're not very far from the finish, and these two are throwing it around a little bit together. Rabobank starting to fight their way in uh, to what is becoming for them one of the best early seasons uh, I think since the team was formed and of course this is the team which is the elite section of what is a real cycling team it spreads right down to the schoolgoers and the young cyclists coming through 
It's a complete cycling sponsorship, the Rabobank team in Holland. And very popular it is too. And they're not very far away. Just across the border is the main base for them, over by Maastricht, which is only a drive of maybe half an hour or so, depending on the traffic, of course. And uh, it looks as though Dembaka has an earpiece there, so he'll be getting all the information. He'll know what the chase is like behind, if there is such a thing right now. They are freezing cold, these riders, although it doesn't show here on the face of Micheli Bartoli. But he's got a clean pair of gloves on there, which indicates to me he's been to the car. We didn't see him go. And he's changed his gloves for the damp, sodden ones, because they were black from memory at the start of the race. So he's changed his gloves, so don't blame him either. That's one advantage of being a top professional, at least you can go back and, uh, and do the best that uh, you can in the situation. They're really struggling now just to keep this pace high, those leg muscles must be absolutely freezing here. And just getting in and out of the saddle will help rather than sit in the same position and slowly get cold. I bet Barsley thought he'd done away with his long sleeve jerseys this year, so too. Uh, the uh, Rabobank rider as well. No further time checks coming, but the gap is still up at the minute, and it's still around about two and a half, two and three quarter minutes over the chase group, who are not very far ahead, in fact, of what's left of the main field. Marty Jemison's in that main field. I think he's the only US postal rider left in it. Well, there's the weather, as if we need a reminding. It's now three degrees, as I told you earlier. Uh, very light winds indeed coming in from the north but frankly it's not the wind they're worried about it's the way that cold and very wet and damp rain is soaking through those arms they're on the way down towards we now and once they get down there then they'll be heading up towards the wall the race returning to its start in Charlois this time for the first time for many many years in fact uh, Becchia of Italy won the last race that went to Charlois to Spa uh, which is where the race went to start from from 1986 in the town of Spa but 1982 was the last time the race made a start from Charlois and Charlois which is Belgium's fifth largest city by the way has always played his part in this event and in 1948 through to 1959 it was the start town then it became the finishing town. I thought you'd like this little bit of a history lesson. Finishing town in 1960 through to 1964. So it's always been part of the flesh. And these two riders, a Dutchman and an Italian, and I would think a very irate and upset Oscar Kamazin from Switzerland. And that's a point earlier. I think I called them both Italian, so I hope you spotted that because I didn't. But I just realised I called Kamazin an Italian because of his Italian sponsor. But of course he's not, he's Swiss. The drab and dreary fields of the Ardennes. Wonderful cycling country when the sun comes out. Absolutely superb for uh, cycle touring. Some of the beautiful sights, the towns. Uh, lovely accommodation, very, very quaint places and very narrow roads, not a lot of traffic. I really couldn't recommend this area more highly for cycling, but uh, you do get caught out occasionally in the weather. Why don't you ask me Kelly Bartley? But this man, this is one race he hasn't got on his honours list over the years, and he's done most of them. And Dembaka, not a big winner, but this year showing his finest ever form. As they slowly but surely, in the snow or sleet, uh, make the way. Well, it's three minutes now, so it's still going up. And Bogart, Ertz and Kamazin are still on the counter move here. And they've managed to just pull out a little more than a minute over that field. Now, we're having difficulty bringing you pictures of anybody else except the two leaders because the weather has claimed one of our motorbikes. We've had a crash and uh, the Belgian television has lost one of its motos. Uh, hopefully without injury, but it means we can't transmit the pictures from Moto2 at the moment. So we're having to stay with the two leaders all of the time and just look at these conditions. I hope we can see them through to the finish right now, because the sleet is on the lens of the camera. And this is when I fully admire too, not just the bike riders, but the Moto pilots and the bre very brave cameramen who will not stop looking through that little tiny lens and swiveling around on the back of that motorbike to make sure we get the pictures as clear as he can possibly give them to us while at the same time caring little it seems about uh, his own well-being and thank heavens for the camera out of the helicopter today 
which is sending us some pretty good pictures considering and you see whenever this goes downhill this course Bartley just rides away from Dembacker and it's unusual to see a Dutchman quite so cautious they tend to be terrific bike handlers from Holland uh, but at the moment it's a little Bartley who is handling the affair better 8% descent here as we begin to run away out of these narrow roads and again look at this look at the gap which Bartley has opened on Dembaka this is not an attack he's not trying to do anything other than get to the finish as fast as he can but he's taking just that little bit of a risk and you know it's always easier to lead than follow down a mountain because you see your own track down whereas a rider who tries to match the speed of somebody else often makes a mistake a little right hander using the apex of the corner by Bartley just on seven seasons as a pro now Michele Bartoli running out of the woods now away it will soon be on the bottom of the valley road this is the tight turn which will take us down onto the main road Bartoli continuing to accelerate out of those corners and Dembaka having to use that little bit more energy to close the gap he, he can never allow Bartoli any length at all here he's got to jump on him just three miles from the finish now so we'll be on the bottom briefly into the town of Huy the last mile is all uphill there's the main road such as it is all the traffic of course is not allowed on it today for the arrival of the flesh and now Dembaka will say well it's all or nothing now just the one climb lies ahead it's virtually downhill into the town of Huy Bartley in that beautiful time trial position he looks such a nice neat compact rider and these two are going to be so pleased to see the finish. The big legs there of the 1996 Dutch champion before Michael Bogart took over for a couple of years. Bogart now in the chase group behind but will be coming in as the passenger. I wonder if he'll be able to snatch third on the line because he's going to be involved in a sprint I would think between Mario Ertz and Oscar Kamazin. Ertz now part of the Lotto team having moved across from the Nursery Flandre in 2002. A lot of people talking about young Ertz as a real star of the future and Belgium as we know seem to have found one with Frank van den Broek after his great ride uh, in his first Paris-Roubaix in the seventh and he's also uh, been intruding in the other big races this year as well. He just needs to stop falling off quite so frequently I think and then he, he should uh, get some good results. Not that he hasn't got quite a few already by the way. Outskirts of Wee here now as the riders run down by the Mers. This has been an incredible attack whatever you think in conditions like this. Uh, I'm just wondering though the wiseness of such a long sortie by Michele Bartoli and Dembaka and of course Kamazin who's still ahead of the field with the upcoming Liege Baston Liege and this man is the winner of that race for the past two years just how much energy is he thrown into this today especially in the cold conditions which must make him very tired two hours in the front and never look to be slackening in the pace he's always looked good and this is the one race he's well not the one but one one of the big classic races he's never won although he's been challenging with a fourth and a fifth in the past into the streets of uh, Hui now and then we'll flick up the climb slight uh, slowing of the pace now because Bartley knows the way up the Hui so does Dembaka and I think uh, with 1.2 kilometers to go to the finish they'll be on the climb this is really the start of the climb although it's not uh, significant just for a few minutes before they start the actual uh, climb up the wall itself and it really is a formidable climb believe me if you ever get the chance to go to Hui try walking up the wall and when you come round the corner and see just how steep it is you'll be amazed kilometer to go well it would be just over a minute of cycling if it wasn't uphill but right now Dembaka is going to have to work out what to do here that's why he looked over his shoulder just to make sure nobody's coming he knows the odds against him winning this are pretty slim but if he can just land it right he might get one over on Bartoli the Dutch have only had uh, 
one victory in this race, by the way, and that was Jörg Zutemelk back in 1976 when it was over 227 kilometers and it was raced between Vervier and Vervier, all in the Ardennes, all the towns around. This is the start of the climb now. It gets steeper just around the corner as we flick right and then sharp left. The crowd, the very brave crowd, who got absolutely soaked today watching this race, which has been run over nearly five hours. It's a good idea to make sure the brakes aren't catching, I would think, uh, Martin, as you start the climb. Bartley, just staying out of the saddle almost tempting the Dutchman to come alongside him. Look at the difference in the build of these two riders. The little lithe figure of Bartoli and the rather much bigger man from Holland. It's all that cheese, probably. Now, this is the right before we take the hairpin left, and it's not just a steep bit in the middle, but it's a nasty little drag out towards the line over the top, where you've really got to hold on to your power output. Bartley looking good, sitting in the saddle. This is the sharp left turn, the Italian flag flying on the left of the road there. The American flag, well, the best American in the race right now is Marty Jemison, and he's in that chase group at around about four minutes. Now, this is where you normally start the attack, and it's who lasts longest survives to win in this case. Oh, and the motorbike behind almost lost it as well, but they've recovered. We almost had no moto cameras. Bartley, shoulder to shoulder, these two gentlemen are going to let strength decide the winner of the flesh because they're going to go up side by side. Neither is hidden in the slipstream of the other. They've shared the pace for two hours. There's the Dutch flag as well, and now Bartley goes, and there's not a lot of reaction from Dembaka. I think he'd already conceded. The Belgian police watch him passively because there's no Belgian here today, but look at the acceleration of this man. Now, is this the start of the weekend double, which isn't the weekend at all now, but even so, the man that's won Liège, Baston Liège for the last three, uh, two years, can he make it three, and this time couple it up with his victory in the flesh wallon? Because Michele Bartoli has made his effort, he's got the gap, now the legs must be absolutely screaming, and he's got to hang on just that little bit longer, sat in the saddle, dropped it up a gear, found some more acceleration, this is everything now. Bartley drives up to the front, up to the finish, just like his Italian uh, compatriots Fondrius and Argentine and Ferlan have done in the years gone by. This time it's Michele Bartoli, who's about to convert his fifth of last year, his fourth of the year before, into a win this time. A massive crowd here on the climb as well. They brave the conditions to appreciate what has been a real show of attacking cycling today by these three. And I say three because it's really bad luck on Oster Oscar Kamazin who is still to finish. Now this is when it's really hurting Bartoli, but unfortunately for Dembaka it's also hurting him and there's not a lot left. And in fact, Michele has found a little bit more of acceleration there as the gap opens right out. Look at the face of Martin Dembaka. He's still nonetheless celebrating his best season as Michele Bartoli continues a great year for him. This will be his fifth win of the year and probably the best in Flesh Wallon. A good average speed too of 40.3, nowhere near the record by the way. A couple of kilometres now short of that but in these conditions who cares. Martin Dembaka gets over the line in second place. The clock has ticked by 14 seconds. So they are in, and now it'll be a while. Further down then on the climb itself, it looks as though Mario Ertz, this long, tall, lanky Belgian, is going to give the home crowd something to shout about here. They spotted the lotto colours as they cheered him on now, away from uh, Oscar Kamazin and Michael Borgert. They're the other two riders. There's Kamazin. So Kamazin's done well. He's going to hang on for fourth. Where's Bogart? There he is, Bogart, the champion of Holland continues the season which got him a victory in Paris Nice this year he's still up in the thick of it now as we come towards the end of April but this will be the best result for this Lotto rider and Jean-Luc Vandenbroek the manager and general director of Lotto will be pretty pleased that he's found another man now to add to his stable uh, Andre Schmil of course is the man for the different types of classics like Paris-Roubaix, Tour of Flanders now he's got a man who appears to be able to be strong enough in the climbs as well. So Mario Ertz comes clear. In fact, the clock is just coming up three minutes now. So it's a big gap to these three. And the main field is on the climb as well. So they weren't that far ahead. Kamazin, the world champion, has now shown his form. 
He looks as though he's on course for a good Giro d'Italia. Michael Bogert, certainly no disgrace to the tricolour jersey of champion of Holland at all. But Ertz is the man today, outside of Michele Bartoli, in this terrible weather. Some would say very Belgian, and he should ride well in these conditions, because when I lived in Belgium, it rained every day like this for six weeks. But you get used to it. As uh, Mario Ertz comes up towards the summit, he will get third place today. The world champion, two victories under his belt from last year, the Tour of Lombardy and the world title, Oscar Kamazin, now heading up towards what will be fourth place. There's the clock coming up three minutes, and it's going to be even over that on the line. It's going to be 3.056 probably. And then Oscar Kamazin that joins him just a little bit further back at around 3.12. And then comes Michael Bogart, so it'll be fifth for the Rabobank champion. And the chase behind is close because this is Udo Boltz here, the ever-reliable telecom man who's leading the rest, Marco Vela from Epitone Uno, Kus Murenhut is also there from Rabobank. Rabobank had a good day out today, they get three men in the top ten finishes. Bogart gets the line just ahead of Udo Boltz. And then Marco Velo, the name I think every cyclist would love to have, he gets over the line in seventh place today for Mercatoni Uno. Pantani, by the way, not riding today, you may have guessed that. Jens Voigt is the rider for Credit Agricole, and they're going to continue to come over the line here one by one. Seiko putting Paolo uh, Salvadelli there, just passing through the screen. He'll have passed over about tenth. Benesto looking at his watch, that is Mansebo. Johnny Farazin from the Mape boys. And uh, that looks like the Benesto's Eitor Osa. Now, what's in this little group here of mixed legs? Well, we've got Marty Jemison on the left, and that's been a good ride by Marty today as he stamps his way up the climb. He's going to get a top 20 finish here, and that's going to say a lot for Marty. Andrea Noah and David Rebelin are going away. Marty, just look at the face of Marty Jemison here. This has been a terrible day. If anything, these are the worst conditions right now at the finish as they continue to zigzag their way up. Jorg Jatska is the telecom rider in that little group as Rebeling comes up to the line here Andrea Noah and Marty Jemison crossing the line now as the clock tells us you can't see it but I can just short of four minutes there we are 448 so that's a very very good ride indeed US Postal are also shaping up for a great season there's the result though a very emphatic win for Michele Bartoli from Martin Dembaka the uh, two partners in crime today they left behind Oscar Kamazin there'll be talk about that but the rest of them all came in uh, over the next five minutes this was the shoulder to shoulder battle between two gentlemen professionals who'd ridden the last two hours of the race together they chose to just ride side by side and made a best man win and on this occasion there was no doubt that was the Italian Michele Bartoli before a crowd who actually loved Bartoli racing in this part of the world because he is such a popular bike rider uh, they won't be at all unhappy it wasn't the Belgium first to the top of the Mwer de Huy today and just inside five minutes so Michele gets his first flesh wall on trophy now can he make it an Ardenne double by winning Liège Baston Liège for the third time and just before I go, don't forget, visit us on our website. Lots of interesting things for you to view there. The address is www.worldcycling.com. Until the next time, this is Phil Liggett saying goodbye to you all.